<laughs> you, the, la the last time I saw you was at Kil Club Kilimanjaro. When are you traveling to Europe? We're go, we're, leaving, we're going to, uh, to Europe on Tuesday. Um, is there any particular function? No, we are, we're going basically to... Um, we're on tour, you know, we, we, we have a new album out. And we're, we're, we, we just uh, we started in St. Kitts, we did the St. Kitts annual music festival and then we did uh, the Kansas City festival and we did uh, the African festival in Brooklyn and we played in Boston and we played in Philadelphia and we played, um, where else did we play? We played in Northampton and now here we are in New York and then we're going to England and we're doing Oxford and Cambridge and just by coincidence we're doing the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, on the 18th of July, which is Mandela's birthday, and I think that um, our embassy, we've got a very big South African community in, in England, and uh, they've sort of uh, elected it as the official celebration for Mandela in, in England, but it's just coincidence, so like, that's the story, folks. We're very happy because it's, re it's amazing to, to, to see somebody they dedicate their life so much, go to jail for almost 30 years, come out with a big smile, and still be able to get, live to be 80. When I grow up, I'd like to be just half as good as that. Who was the first Caribbean artist you ever worked with, and where did you work with them, in the Caribbean or in North America? I've never really, really worked with a, a Caribbean artist, so to speak, but when Bob Marley was studying, you know, Johnny Nash was a very good friend of mine. And he went to live in Jamaica, and he started. He went up there and stirred it up, and um, and also did. Uh, uh, um, I can see clearly now. The rain is gone, but at that time, Bob Marley um, uh, uh, was starting out. With, with, he was hardly. He had just gotten the whalers together, and they were starting out, and he was recording. And um, uh, you know, Johnny Nash and um, Danny Sims, his partner and manager, asked me to like play on a few uh, songs, you know, but they were just starting out then. That's the only time I really remember uh, playing with a, um, a Caribbean artist, but it turned out to be a great honor later, and I think he mentions it in his books. When was the first time you blessed the show? But uh, 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 Sparrow, uh, I'm a great admirer of Sparrow, and of course we played with a lot of uh, Caribbean artists at, um, at the St. Kitts Festival, you know, uh, David Rada was there, and of course, Dennis, uh, Brown. Dennis Brown was there, and uh, Maxi Priest was there. But we're all Caribbean when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to the bottom of it. Yeah. And uh, uh, um, I've, you know, I've, I've played in concerts where there was Caribbean artists a lot. I've been in a lot of concerts with Ziggy Mali. I've played with Ziggy Mali actually here at the, the uh, what's the place on Seventy Fifth Street? Oh, the the, uh, the Beacon. Uh, the Beacon Theater. The Beacon Theater, man. Yeah. We just so I him. have. We just missed him in Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. the day before. Yeah. And we just played a, ca a Caribbean festival, actually, a reggae yeah, festival in 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 Kansas. Um, Kansas, in Kansas City. The answer to your question grows bigger and bigger. Yes. Uh, <laughs> next one. When did you first bless the shores of America with your sound, your very unique sound? I first came here to, to school in 1960, and I started jamming just about with everybody, you know. All the jazzers word got around and was a little kid from South Africa I was blowing like Clifford Brown. I was trying to be a, a, a jazz musician there, you know. And uh, I was a mean, pretty mean one. So I, I jammed just with about all 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 the you know uh, young musicians at that time, the Freddie Harbors and the Lee Morgans and Paul Chambers and uh, I played a lot with Les McCann and uh, sat in with a lot of people. But uh, in 1961 I started playing on records and I played on Miriam McGever's second record. I played a muted trumpet and that is called the Many Voices of uh, Miriam McEver and uh, Symphony Seed, who was on WEVD in those days, like he had a very powerful program here. And he started playing um, uh, 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 the songs that I played with Miriam. I did three songs on the album with a, uh, uh, with a, uh, a muted trumpet, you know, that Belafonte produced. And I played on some Belafonte records and from those I got um, Recording contracts. So by the time I, I, I finished school, um, I had uh, three albums already. But I went to school with a very stellar uh, group of people. You know, David Grusin, Harry Rosen, Ron Carter, uh, Eric Dolphy, uh, um, Ron, uh, what's his name, Donald Bird, 
Larry Willis, David Eisenzen, uh, 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 what's his name? Piano player, uh, Chick Corea, um, a whole bunch of people, David, uh, 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 Micah Benny. It goes on and on and on, a whole lot of people. Manhattan School of Music. What could you remember the year? 1960 to 1963. That's when it was in Spanish Harlem, on 105th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. But now it's uh, where Juilliard used to be on uh, 122nd and Broadway. <laughs> they waited till I left, then they took it out of the ghetto. <laughs> when was the first day you, you traveled to London and, and played in London? Are you looking forward to playing in London? I not only have I played in London, but I lived in London from 1985 to 1988, 89 I lived in London because I'd been living in Botswana and uh, the South African uh, uh, Defense Force death squads came in and killed a whole lot of us. I was one of the people who survived from there and uh, I had to go into second exile. I was just preparing to wait in Botswana until we got free in South Africa. And I'd been there for five years and here they come shooting bang bang again, I had to get out of town. So I lived in, and, and I originally went to school before I came here in 1960. I went to the Guildhall School of Music for six months before I got a scholarship uh, um, uh, to come to the Manhattan uh, School of Music with the aid of John Mehigan, who was um, uh, the jazz professor at Juilliard, and of course uh, Harry Belafonte, who I, I, I worked for part-time when I was in school. I worked for his publishing company, Clara Music, and. Uh, uh, Louis Armstrong helped me very much, and uh, Miriam McKeb, of course, helped right. me the most. And uh, um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Everything you said was okay. fine. Next good question is this: is, um, um, in performing, do, what what types of room? Uh, um, I know you. What types of room do you like to perform to? Be, uh, small rooms, big rooms. I mean, where where do you find your solitude when you when you when you're performing, as far as um, the, the the venues? I'm happiest at a place that helps me pay the rent, you know. Um, and people tend to think that musicians go around with like preferences, like I want a brown room with a grey carpet or, you know. Uh, but anyway, where they treat you well, where the audience uh, enjoys it. You don't, you don't choose your gigs, you get hired. And you're hoping that people will hire you all the time because we have lives like other people who have to work and every time you're working you're able to like and pay the bond, you're able to help your child go through school, you're able to like buy put food on the table. So in the end, it's a job like everybody um, else has to work. Some people do extremely well and some people, you know, get caught up in conspicuous consumption. But in the end, it's really a job. And like I said about my grandmother, in the end, it's no big thing. You know, you just put on this world to be grateful. So I don't, I don't, I don't have the grandiosity problem. <coughs> what impact has the music have uh, had on the world, you know, or to um, younger generation? Um, music is a very difficult role to play because politicians are, are very, very uh, scared, terrified of uh, influential musicians as has been exemplified by how much they resisted Bob Dylan and how much the establishment press has knocked him, has knocked Bob Marley, has knocked, has knocked uh, uh, John Lennon, uh, has you know, they hated Miles Davis, they hated, they hated any musicians to tell the truth, you know, so uh, it would be a lie to say that music, music actually uh, 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 plays a role in changing things, but it helps influence people to realize uh, that there's things that are not right, you know, in society, or that there's oppression, and that there's many artists who put their necks out there. But the establishment does not necessarily like a loudmouth musician who makes people aware, because politicians are itinerary people who are just passing by, and musicians are there forever, and uh, they don't like the power of, of of the influence, especially on the youth, you know, who are the people of the future, because it makes them look bad. So you find that. Um, in repressive societies, for instance, musicians usually run away from there. If, if one thing, what would you like to leave for, for, for generations to come? One thing that I'd like, like to leave? For generations to come, to remember you by. Uh, well, I think what I said about my grandmother, you know, that really when you're born, you don't bring any money, you don't bring any clothing, you have nowhere to live. 
and uh, for uh, 18 years uh, we are put up for free and they buy you clothes and they buy you they teach you how to uh, uh, talk how to walk they show you where the bathroom is and uh, you get free boarding and lodging and you should always be grateful and remember that you have a major debt because you don't pay rent for 18 years some people never leave home